Ricky believes in free coaching. You're saying that they haven't Ricky's had those paid coaching. calls. Ricky's training. Ricky's not coaching. He's training. He knows the difference. Oh, oh okay. Okay. Now we, now we got something to talk about. But, but listen, <laughs> but listen, here's the thing. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Road to 10,000. I'm Ricky Caruth, and I'm with my guy, Juan Carlos, as always. And today we have a very special guest. This guy is a living legend in the real estate industry. And uh, I mean, this guy actually at, at one point sold over 200 houses with his wife and became one of the major real estate coaches in the industry and was actually my only coach. Right. So I played, I paid this guy $1,000 per month for four months back in 2015 to talk to me once a week. And I'm really uh, excited for this, this conversation, this interview. I want to uh, welcome Mr. Tim Harris to the podcast. What's up, my guy? How many years ago was that, Ricky? 2015. Oh my God. I'm getting old. How old were you? How old were you then? Let's you were see. like fresh, weren't you? Fresh. I was. Estate, I was thirty-four, I guess. Let's see, yeah, yeah, I was like thirty-four, something oh like that. Oh my God, you're older than forty now. Wow. I'll be forty. I'll be forty next month. Tim, you happen? are. Tim, you are the coaches of coaches. <laughs> no, well, see, Juan's going to make us be professional. We're just having fun. <laughs> well, you know, I don't like being called a living legend because I'm not that old, but I'll take it, Ricky. No, I think you are. I mean, to me, you are, all right? And that's really all that matters it. right here on this podcast. <laughs> well, Ricky, so straight up, straight up, what you've done in your career, it's, you're like, you know, the, I don't even know what percent it is. You, you had, you went from no, having no sales background, really, and you totally and completely got into real estate and you did the real work of real estate. That's something that this whole generation, they don't even know how to do, but you did it, man. You grinded it out. You did the real work. And that's the reason you dominated. So what you're experiencing now at EXP is a direct result of the fact that you learned how to grind the right way and didn't over, you know, you didn't double down on dumb when you got into business. You actually did the real work of real estate. Mad respect for real, dude. There's not very many people. I mean, you are going to be a living legend. You know, you're the one. There's how many people your age and you're not even that old, but I mean, I'll make I'll make you feel old just for fun. But how many people your age actually even know how to have the skill set to actually do the real work of real estate? You know, it's like five, five people total. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Because any anybody that came into real estate after 2008, 2009, they're just basically thrown in the, you know, the sea of full of just swamp things, teaching people how to buy leads, work on your branding, build your team, do all this other stuff. And you were smart enough to go directly after the people who had their hands in their air say, yes, I want to sell my house. Don't you think, honestly, Ricky, that seems a little just ridiculous that people are confused that if they want to make money the quickest helping people, that they wouldn't just go after the people that already had their hands in their air saying, yes, I want to sell my house. Doesn't that seem insane? Dude, there's a lot of things that seem insane to me right now, <laughs> to be honest with you. Yeah, and that's one of them. But I really appreciate that, man. That means a lot. Do you even remember? Do you, do you just think back and just honestly, do you remember any of our any of our coaching yeah, I want to know what, what was I'll that tell you like? what I remember I'll tell you what I remember you were a madman I'll tell you I'll tell you were, you were certain things out personally you're much calmer now than you were then I do remember that I do remember you you had worked on an oil rig I do mm -hmm. remember that I do remember you told me you got hit in the head I do remember that I remember you were uh you were uh ruthless with your intention in mm -hmm. other words you were you were one of these people that say you were going to do something like what everyone says you know, I'm going to make 20 contacts. And then the next week you'd show up, you'd made 30, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. That's what I remember. I yeah. remember that because very few people act like that. I acted yeah. like that. Julie mm -hmm. acted like that, but very few people do. I'm sure at yeah. this point, dude, you've been in this game long enough. You, how many people do you run into it, that are just blah, blah, blah. They're tall hat, no cattle. Yeah. They talk yeah. about what they're going to do. They make their Instagram videos. They do all this branding and they want to talk about their big visions, but they're not willing to go in onto the oil rig and risk getting hit in the head and do the real work. Truth. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. And that's the reason you're killing in DXP now because you mm -hmm. learn how to do the real work. Yeah. How about no, that? Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. It, it's absolutely true. Let's go back, man. I want to hear a little bit. I'm sure everybody wants to hear just a piece when I would spend a whole lot of time on it. But I want to hear a little piece about your actual real estate sales career. You know, when you started, kind of how it went, like how you got up to a certain point and then transition into the, the coaching industry. I just want to I just want to hear that. 
Okay, it's kind of boring, but all right. So no, I mean, it's it kind of boring, and we can make it really short. I just want to kind okay, of okay. We'll make it really short. Far, yeah, yeah, I just want to hear the short end of it because it because it's an amazing story. I mean, you got up to selling over two hundred properties a year, and then you get into the the coaching scene. And I hey, mean, look, so you just told the story. There was this. I'm out. <laughs> you did it. No, our our first year in the business, we sold. And when Julie and I, so Julie and I got we've been married for thirty years this year. How about that? We got wow. married when we were tw- we got married when we were twenty and twenty one, and we bought our first house when we were twenty two and twenty three. So we've been in real estate. I'm fifty one, so we've been in real estate for more than twenty five years. And when we mm-hmm. started selling real estate, got our licenses, our first full year in the business, we sold one hundred and three houses with our pendings. And uh, as far as I know, no one's ever done that before. No, no one's ever done that since. Now, if you think I'm saying that we are some sort of business sales geniuses back then to do that, we weren't. We just basically worked hard, and that's. We didn't even count how many houses. I told this story before, but I think it's funny. Julie and I were sitting outside a movie theater in Dublin, Ohio, waiting for a movie to start some Friday evening or something. And we were trying to remember and add up how many houses we'd sold. And this was like in July. So we called our broker and his name was Rory Averill. He's you know, a fantastic broker. And we said, uh, Rory, how many houses is like, what's good for a sold in a year? Like, what is something that, you know, is special? And he goes, this is exactly how the conversation went. He goes, how many have you sold? And we said, well, we sold, we think about 75. And he goes, call me, call me back when you get to hundred, click. That's all he said. And that was in July, you know? So we did. And, and then after that, what I didn't realize was that Remax was paying attention. National Association of Realtors was paying attention, all these other organizations. And this was pre-internet, um, you know? And so what, what happened then was we got all this national press and just to, to frame this out, Prior to getting to real estate, I had a car cleaning and detailing business, you know, and uh, we were in college, okay? And so our first year in business, we did this. And then what happened as a result of that, of this sort of, you know, I don't know what you want to call it, I'll call it fame, was really uncomfortable. And then we didn't know what to say yes to, what to say no to, and we were flying different states. You've done stuff like this, Rick, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And it's like, and then, then you realize it takes your eye off the ball. We are, our original mission was to own enough paid off rental properties by the time I was 40 and Julie was 39 that we would be able to live off our cash flow. It took us a year longer. I was 41 and she was 40, but we accomplished it. We stayed on mission. But there's so many things that, you know, like that big, you know, burst of fame when we are in our formidable, easily impressionable years, you know, that got us off track for like a year or two. Then we got back on track because our accountant said, you know what, you guys are making, you're selling more houses now and you're making more money. This is at like year three or whatever. This is when we were doing different speaking events. We didn't realize, you know, we didn't know about coaching. Coaching didn't even exist really. Um, and then he said, so you guys are selling more units, making more money. We're getting more attention, right? More plaques and awards and shit. But then he showed me our, you know, profit and loss he said, but you're making less net income. <laughs> so I was like, okay, well, we're off mission. We need to get back on mission. And that's what we did. So that was a really good lesson for us that people nowadays aren't even having the opportunity to learn. Um, but from that, and so we are Howard Britton. Why, stars. Were you, why were you making less money? Net profit, not less money. Net I mean, profit. I mean, I mean, yeah, net profit. Why were you, yeah, making- why were your we're, expenses we started- going up? We started to spend money. We started to spend money on dumb things. We started to spend money on things that, to support our fame. We oh, started to you. do things. Yeah. Like I mean, going out to why. eat nice restaurants and spending money like, uh, uh, you know, like- not, yeah, some of that, but also some like stupid marketing things that, you know, gotcha. people think, well, you know, that you, the shit you do, you thinking that one day it's going to get a result. This is the reason when, you know, I'm gotcha. coaching you or I'm coaching somebody else. And I say, well, there, here's the truth behind postcards. You know, here's the truth behind this internet thing. Or here's the truth behind this. The reason those people selling you those things will never give you or will never answer the question, what's my return on investment is because there won't be one. And all they're trying to do is sell into your ego's desire to be famous. And so what I learned then, and I didn't put all the words together, and this is an interesting question for you guys, especially Juan. I think Juan is even younger than you, Ricky. Right? Yeah, he's just, about just 10 a little years bit. younger. So, so, I mean, the question you got to ask yourself just a little bit, oh, he's grinding you. I caught that. <laughs> Good work. <laughs> so the question the question you got to ask yourself when you're in your formidable years and um it, would you rather be famous or rich and you can't be both so if you have to choose between rich or being famous what would you choose and nowadays and i've asked that question tens of millions of times to coaching clients when they're younger they always say they always say they argue with the question oh we can be both and then they'll say well i'd rather be famous and then you know as they get older they realize that fame doesn't get you any you can't eat it fame you can't eat fame right and so then they all regret having sought uh, being rich over being famous and that this generation is especially plagued with that that's what's really unfortunate 
But to finish out what your question was, Ricky, so we were uh, we got involved in Howard Britton. Howard Britton made us Julie and I stars. I think it was 96 or 97. And then we were at a Howard Britton conference. And we were in the back of the room. This is before your time. I don't do you know who Howard Britton is? Do you remember mm -hmm. him? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he passed away. Uh, it was a, anyway. So we was, all, he, was Howard, he a real estate coach? He no, he no, he he was like uh, he was pretty much in his day. He was pretty much the guy. So back in the day, you had Howard Brenton. And if you were a Howard Brenton star of the month, that was essentially like you were being invited to be a knight at the round table. There were, this was pre-internet, remember. This was back when people read the real estate, the Realtor Association magazine, right? This was a big deal. When you got that Realtor Association magazine, it was like, oh my gosh, I have to that set this That was kind of like y'all's MLS, right? <laughs> Look at y'all. Look at, see how this is the age thing. This is the underlying <laughs> thing, calling each other old. No, I'm talking about the National Association of Realtors, today's Realtor Magazine. Oh, I got you. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's where they had their 40 under 40. That's where they got did all you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They still do that. But that back in the day, that magazine was huge. It was really thick. And it was mm -hmm. something that people really look forward to. Just to, I'm trying to frame it out compared to the juxtaposition today. Mm -hmm. So Howard Brenton would do, he would invite you to you know show up at a studio someplace. And he would do an interview with you. And it would be sort of, you know, not less tactical and practical like what you guys do and more focused on you know the personal side of things that kind of thing getting to know you types and then he'd have these two he would have annual retreats and the stars would i won't bore you the rest of the details so he goes in front of a room of probably i don't know 2500 people and julie and i are in the back and i remember he said i'm going to start a coaching business to your question and mm -hmm. i you know he just was getting started thinking about this and we're about to have a break and all of those of you who are interested in um, having us coach you, and there was like three of them had gotten, you know, it was Howard and two other people that work for him. Mm -hmm. I want you to come up and break and put your business card on the stage. And I remember being in the back of the room and seeing like half the room just, you know, it looked like snow on the stage, all the business cards hitting the stage. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. Julie and I were in the back and we were like, huh, <laughs> what the hell just <laughs> happened? You know, <laughs> this is, I'm telling you the truth. And then at that same break, people started asking us, are you guys going to coach? Are you going to coach? And the first person I said yes to, maybe the second was a guy named Michael Gordon. And you guys can Google him. Him and his wife are still one of the most successful couples in real estate. They sell multi-million dollar estates in the main line. They were one of my original clients we met at that time at that Howard Britton conference. And I didn't even know what coaching was. I didn't even know what to charge. You know, I knew nothing. But we just, we just did it. And then what happened was the coaching business the net profit from the coaching business started outpacing the net profit from the real estate business. And then from there, we went on a couple different trajectories, but the real estate, uh, the real estate business, the problem ultimately with selling real estate is the income's transactional, you know, da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. whereas in a coaching business, you can have uh, recurring revenue and mm -hmm. with recurring revenue, then you could, you know, depending on what your churn rate is, you can actually spin that up into something that you can start predictably peeling the money off and doing investing with. There's so, that word, bro. I knew it was going to come up. Oh yeah, but isn't that the game? Churn. I mean, I'm not, look, I'm not right. This dude well, loves yeah, this word, look. churn, dude. Uh, did, did you Google it yet? <laughs> Tim, Tim, I, I got a I question for you. What, what, what's the churn rate on the average client in coaching? Is, is it two, three months? Is it a year? Like how, how long before they usually say, eh, I don't need this coach anymore. And they move on. Well, it depends on what the industry is, right? I mean, a lot of this has been studied. The average churn rate for most coaching organizations is, is probably close to 90%, maybe 95%. Most coaching organizations burn through their clients every single year. And the other coaching organizations Julie and I were associated with was right around theirs. And ours is typically around 55%, mm. you know, 55, 56%. It really is tied to the market, honestly. So if the market's really strong, people stay forever. We have people that have been with us for over a decade. We have personal clients wow. that have been with us for like 15 years. We, dude, it's so creepy as I think about, you know, we have people who I knew them when they were starting their families, had their kids, and now their kids are freaking graduating from high school and off into college. And some of them graduated from college, right? Wow. I mean, and I'm talking to some of these people and I've known them for so long. I, I almost forget how much time has passed. So that's a blessing. I think it's kind of amazing. And, and let me ask you, Tim. So, so as being a coach, like, wouldn't they get your knowledge over that 10, 15 year period? Or are you always teaching them something new? Or is it just an accountability? Well, thing that's a great question, Carlos. And I think that's the reason that people will quit is that their coach isn't themselves constantly expanding and making themselves better. That's actually that question is more insightful than I think you intended for it to be. But that's the number one thing. If you hire someone that has that doesn't constantly isn't constantly self improving themselves, you know, isn't constantly looking for the next level of themselves, mm. they're going to become complacent. And that's naturally going to translate to their actual coaching calls. And that's the reason that when you plug into somebody's done system, like a, 
you know, a center of influence and past client coaching thing. And they have a book of, you know, a series of 12 calls and all the whole thing. I mean, that's not coaching. I don't mm-hmm. even know what that is, honestly. They don't even, my, my daughter's seven, I'm almost seven and a half. And they take a dynamic approach to her learning just like, but that's not how it typically works in this industry. So true coaching isn't really what's happening in the industry right now. Most of what's happening is training and training by people that frankly aren't, um, you know, look, if you're going to hire a coach, you guys argue with me on this point. First of all, you have to hire a coach that has had a real estate license in the past. Would you agree that it's stupid not to hire <laughs> a coach? a starting point, yeah. Okay, but don't you think, honestly, let's, we could just hover there. Yeah. Don't you think it's insane that people are paying, agents are paying people that have never sold real estate before to coach them? Explain that to me. I don't understand no. it. No, I, I'm, I'm try, I've been, that's been the debacle for me from day one with this whole thing. You know, what in the world so is going on? What in the world is going on? And, and, and then the coaches who, who have been in the business two years, sold 19 properties. <laughs> no, you're getting my second point. Don't stack on my next point. You're doing it. Okay. So have they had a license? Okay. Then the second question is, did they sell a hundred houses in a year? Mm. Just, okay. That's, that's mm. the first two filters. Then the third mm. filter is, have they actually sold over a hundred houses for five years in a row? So they mm. could have sold a hundred houses in a year and they could have been their uncle's subdivision or they could have been a tower in Miami. Right. right. I don't think that counts. Right. That doesn't count. A bunch right. of gimme listings doesn't count. They have to have been doing it like Ricky did, like Julie and mm. I did, like all of our coaching clients. You have to go out there and do it one at a time. That's where you become really good. So, mm. okay, they had one good year, but then they have soft, sophomore slides and fail. Well, then you look up, if you're really looking to hire a good coach, then you look at someone that sold over hundred houses per year for at least five years in a row. You with me? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, now this next one's going to knock everyone out. You mm. have to look for someone that's had at least 10,000 paid coaching calls. How many people in the industry like that? So, so let me ask you, Tim, and, and this is a controversial subject. Ricky believes in free coaching. You're saying it, they haven't Ricky's had those not paid coaching. calls. Ricky's training. Ricky's not coaching. He's training. He knows the difference. Oh, oh okay. Okay. Now we, knows, now we got something to talk about. <laughs> but, but listen, but listen, here's the thing. The, the, the markets voted on Rickster. Okay. He wouldn't have, he wouldn't be doing what he's doing in his life at, at EXP, especially on YouTube, especially if his training didn't have value, but he, Rick, you know, you're not coaching, you're training. You can't, you can't coach in a big mass, you know, listen only mode. You right, know the difference. Right. Well, I mean, the way I see it is, is the content out there and the co- the coaching quote unquote program is training, right? It's how, here's how you sell real estate. Step one, two, three, four, boom. This is how I do it. Here's the programs and everything else. But what goes on behind the scenes right? There's all kinds of calls. I talk to agents all day long and those yeah, are, that's coaching. See, that's those are coaching calls. I mean, like I'm, I I'm, it's, it's, uh, um, it's, it's helping them navigate, you know, through the frustrations and through the ups and downs and, you know, where to go next and how to structure your day and, uh, things like that. So behind the scenes, coaching, well, uh, out on front street training. Can I respectfully challenge you on that even? Absolutely. Because I coached you and, you know, so I know you know the difference, right? <laughs> okay. Well, so, so here's the thought for you. Training is teaching. Training, right. training is basically standing in front of a group of people. That is easy compared to coaching. Coaching yeah. is like tutoring. Right, right. right. So coach, coaching is basically one-on-one asking questions that are designed to basically move the other person along. And mm-hmm. that takes a hell of a lot of skill and you can't fake it. Now, right. most, pe- most people won't know the difference because they've never had that experience before. Yeah. They, don't, they, they think their training is coaching, but it's not. Right. And, and, and honestly, 90% of the products we sell are training. They're not coaching because finding really good coaches is a bitch. Yeah. Because yeah. most people will never put in the time to become a really good coach. They won't. You right. know, Julie and I did probably because we we're, I don't even know why we did in retrospect, to be honest with you. You know, we did it because it was a challenge because we wanted to become really, really great at something. We mm. like, we're so much better at, at this than we were at real estate. It's not even funny. We wanted, you know, the book that, you know, mostly Julie wrote. <laughs> That is kind of funny, even though our names, I mean, this, when I look at the sales in this book, that's an affirmation of basically, and, but there's no coaching in here. It's all training. Mm. That's what this says. So, so yeah, Tim, the, the, the coaching is really separated when, when that person's actually holding them accountable. Is that what it is? It's not more, it's more than accountability. I mean, I could, we could do it if I don't want to make you uncomfortable, but we can have a little conversation right now. I mean, <laughs> I mean Ricky knows, Ricky knows what I'm talking about. I mean, you, you have to cut through people's bullshit and get at the heart mm-hmm. of what really motivates them. Right. So, so let me share, share with you guys a story. So, so, but before you get into that, Tim, how much of the coaching is actually you 
helping them on the personal development side, as opposed to actually teaching them real estate? Uh, you mean they're kind of intertwined. I mean, especially right. in real estate. There's, you can't teach no one without the other. Yeah. There's no separation. I mean, when you, when you want to, when you want any kind of business, but especially a small business, you have the antivirus software that's constantly running in your head. Right. So even if you're, and so people think that they can have separation of business and personal life and be successful. It, it doesn't exist. That's bullshit. Cause it's always running in your head. And a lot of people feel guilty because they're thinking about business when with their families. Well, guess what? That's the way it works. You have to think like that if you want to be successful. And if you don't want to be successful, then you're in conflict with that. You're, you're fighting your antivirus software. So that's the reason it's intertwined, ultimately. That's a great question, though. Juan, I agree. you're kicking your I agree. Uh, ass in the question. That, that's the content <laughs> snippet right there. We just got it. I'm going to frame it. Big headline, you know? That's what we need. Yeah, well, there's a, but there's a lot of... There's, a lot of uh, there's so much bullshit that's being perpetuated, but it's not just specifically from the coaching industry, too. It's just like, you know, all these little things that people say, like, follow your passion and the money will fall. Not true. You have to have balance in your life. Not true. You know, and this whole generation of agents that are coming up, well, look at, I mean, we look at buyer agency. How many mm -hmm. agents right now, when they get into their business, are said, told to work with buyers. Yeah. And, yeah. and yeah. before, and before working with sellers was the mental labor and working with, with buyers is the physical labor. Can we agree to that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, and so in other words, working with buyers was easier than working with sellers because it was less skills-based. But I'll go, I'll say not only is it more skills based now to work with buyers, yeah. right? But you, you mean, also you mean in today's market of over yeah, inventory man. and multiple it's offers. Brutal. It's yeah, brutal. Yeah. Yeah. It, and, and get this, Ricky, commissions are falling. Are they falling? Buyer agent commissions falling in your market? Nah, kind of. Yeah, it's not like hardcore, but we yeah, we see it. We're starting. Yeah. Yeah, they're falling. Basically, they're falling all over the United States. If you want me to give you numbers on that, I will. But it's, you know, I just gave you the bottom line. And then you have this other thing that's happening is there's more people getting real estate licenses now than in the history of real estate. All those people during COVID, guess what they were doing after they put on their COVID-19? Yeah. They decided to go to real estate champions and get licenses. Mm -hmm. And so our friends that own those companies, you know, Aceable and some of these other companies, they're telling us that there's such a huge amount of people that are waiting to get their licenses. And what are all those agents going to do when they get their licenses? They're going to be told to work with buyers. Work with buyers. With buyers. And, and so, exactly, man. And so if you're an agent now thinking it's hard to work with buyers, you get a bit another probably six months on the outside and you're going to have more people that are competing with for those buyers. Whereas before you didn't really have to compete with them, your commissions are falling. It's going to be harder for you to find or put somebody in contract. That's yeah. just the reality. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I've got um, agents that are working with buyers and they say, Ricky, how do we get these multiple, these, these, how do we get my buyer's offer accepted? You know, And I'm like, well, number one, let's try to work with more sellers, right? Number one, but let's talk about the buyer situation. And in the same breath, they're talking about, they're going to learn how to do short sales for when the market turns. It ain't going to you know, turn. It's, it's a no seller's time. market right now. Well, it's a seller's market right now. Okay. And, and I'm still selling, right? And by, are you still selling? No, we haven't sold in forever, dude. When was the last time you sold a house? I don't even remember. I mean, it was it was probably ten years. Uh, yeah, probably more. Than I'm just curious years. if you were to sell your house, we, would you we, physically? We, do, we, we sell our Rick. We do our own transactions. Julie and I, we we, we do our own transactions. Yeah, we, we have a lot of rental properties. We have Tim, right, would, right, would, right. Would, would you sell your own house at this point if you had to go list one of your personal residences, or would you hire someone? Uh. I had always hire a real estate agent for sure. I mean, we always. But you do. have an agent at this point. You're like completely out. Yeah. Yeah, completely out. But I mean, we're you're 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 not. I mean, Julie and I have been out. We our real our coaching business is, you know, massive, massive. Yeah, so what I'm saying much. is, is 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 it's the mid eight figures a year. I mean, it's mid eight figures right. a year. So, yeah, yeah. I, well, I did yeah. the math. But I'll back tell in you, 2015. I yeah, I, I'll tell you right now, I miss actually aspects of selling. I miss the listing appointment. That's what I miss mm. competing against somebody like Ricky, right? You know what? You know what? I'm the same way and I'm, I miss, I'm still selling and, and this and that. I look back sometimes and I, I'll be honest with you. I kind of miss sometimes the oil rig working on a roof, to be For honest real. with you. Just the Me little too. things and the mental capacity, the focus. It's uh, it's the know, presence, you, Ricky. That's yeah. what it is, the being present. I, I actually sometimes miss all the way back when we had our car cleaning and detailing business over 30 years ago, mm. I missed the idea of starting something and finishing it, right? Starting with somebody's car and then having our little group of guys knock it out, having it be done, having the customer really be happy. That whole process was very rewarding. And then you get paid, then you're done. 
You know, yeah. there's something about that completion of something that you don't really get in a coaching business or, but mm-hmm. you did get it selling real estate because you go out and compete. You know, if you aren't competing, it wasn't fun, right? If you're no, against, no, you want to it's all competition. Stuff. I mean, yeah, it's all man. competition, mostly myself, but it's, it's all competition, man. Tell me right now about you, 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 blood, you, you, you said something right there that caught my ear that the seller marker is not going away. Is that what yeah. you said? Oh yeah, for sure. Please, please. I wanted to hear this. Well, you tell me what you, you pontificate a bit. I'm not used well, to the Well, Rick, so well, I mean, here. I mean, it, it, but this can't last forever. <laughs> I mean, this can't last forever. I know that much. Um, what I was getting at a while ago is I've got people asking me about buyers. Okay. At the same breath, they're saying they're going to start working towards understanding short sales and pre foreclosures and that kind of thing for when the market flips, if and ever it does. And I'm thinking, okay, this agent is in a position now where they're representing a buyer to compete against 15 other buyers. Okay. And that, and then they're going to put themselves in position. They're, they're trying to set their self up to compete against 15 other agents going after the same short sale listing. If the market does flip, it's like these agents are going where the hardest part of the market is. And there's always a soft spot of the market. Right now it's listings. You get a listing, it sells in an hour. You know, that's what I'm focusing on mostly. So it, it's, I'm trying to drill it into some of these agents' heads that the, why are you going, why are you gravitating to, to the toughest places in the market as the market no skill. shifts? You know why? Because it takes skill. You know, you got to know how to pick up the phone. You got to right. know how to pre-qualify and they don't know how yeah. to do it. That's why. Yeah. And Ricky, how many, how many agents, you know, younger than you have come into the industry who have basically been taught, a, you know, a bunch of passive crap by the time. So you, without knowing it, maybe you do verbalize it like this. Hopefully you do. We, our coaching has always been, and our book has always been, and everything we've always done. Look, you want to do a proactive lead generation based and maybe marketing enhanced, but you yeah. don't want to do marketing based and, and, you know, because you're never going to learn how to do the actual lead generation. Right. Once you know how to pick up the phone and you can do it every single day. And Ricky, I actually am having a little, you know, flashbacks. And that, that was something you were really good at. Set one a day, set an appoint, pre-qualified appointment a day and take one a day. How simple mm. of a recipe for success mm. is that? Mm. And yet how many agents will never do it just because they're fearful of rejection and all the rest of these things. But this is what coaching is all about. So to answer your question, this is literally a, a notes from a podcast we did last year that's talking about essentially why the market is, there's a lot of drama out there about the market crashing. Okay, I'll tell you guys a funny story. All right, so um, I get an, a video from, do you know Kevin Cottrell, Ricky? Have you met him yet? Did yeah, you I hadn't met him, but I, I know I know who you're talking about. Okay, so we, Kevin- we, we've, sent, we've chatted a little bit. Good, so Kevin sends me this video and it's this video, doom and gloom, market's gonna blah, 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 blah. Worst mm. case scenario. And I mean, locusts coming and all that sort of thing. So I click on the video and it's very well done. Drama, 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 real estate crashing. Everyone's going to be, you know, it's cannibals on the street. Okay. So then I did, as I went, it was on YouTube. So you could find out who published it. And then I just, you know, way back machined it. I did some homework. Okay. Then I find out who originally published the video. Are you ready for it? The guy that published the video is a, a, do, a survivalist who's selling survival gear. He's selling canned goods. He's selling mm-hmm. freaking mm-hmm. masking tape and, you know, all that crap. So he is trying to basically scare people into thinking the world's going to come to an end. Then he's going to send them back to his stuff to buy your lifetime supply of spam. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay, that's his marketing angle. But agents are not, obviously, smart agents, even like Kevin, aren't discerning the fact that it's just basically hype that's spinning the world around. But let's talk about numbers. So what would be, other than this is the way things go, why would you believe that the market were to, was, was going to crash or correct? So I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you. I'll give you. I'll yeah. give you one example. Let's say interest rates go up again, right? Okay. It becomes a lot more expensive to uh, to borrow money, and now all of a sudden people are saying, eh, "I don't want to buy too many houses." Inventory goes ahead and uh, increases, and boom, the market starts leveling. Uh, that's one example right there. Okay. What you got, one Rick? Well, I mean, it's yeah. No, I was going to kind of say the same thing, but you know, just I mean, a, a strike of of a pen at Washington, interest rates or other policies of some sort. I mean, what does that mean? Happen. Well, That's interest like- rates or some kind of policy. Who knows? I mean, you know, there, it's always something. You know, and what and what causes a crash is normally something that nobody foresaw. Like it's something there that been, sh- was there, shocks was everybody. There- was there ever a real estate crash prior to the one in 07, 08, 09 ever in the United States? Or national I wouldn't one? say as big as that one. No, there no, never was. was. Maybe there a couple of corrections. One. Yeah, but right. Well, not even there was never there was never one national real estate market. That was the first time that ever happened. 
Mm. Okay, so you guys mentioned interest rates. So here's the thing that's ultimately going, there's, there's a couple of variables. And the first two things I'm gonna say actually are the opposite of each other. So are you guys familiar? I'm not being snotty, but do you understand how inflation works? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna but, 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 but explain, explain it for everyone listening, just so they understand where you're coming from. Hmm, okay. So basically the bottom line is everything, all prices on everything are inflating right now. Hmm. It's not just, it's not just uh, like Julie wanted to buy me this pin for Christmas and she couldn't find one because they were sold out everywhere. So, so uh, our, I mean, real estate, houses, cars, car tires, furniture, food, all, everything is, in, is in, essentially increasing in cost. Now, there's two reasons why things, now, some of the people that are Keynesian uh, economists don't believe in inflation. They think the inflation rate is only 2% and inflation is nothing to worry about. So we're going to placate both sides of the argument. So you have inflation and the opposite side of it is, is that the demand is increasing because of demographics. So you have, so both things result in the same result, both uh, demographic trends and a massive amount of millennials and all these other generations of people wanting to buy and sell real estate globally, not just in the United States, the highest concentration. And, and, you know, because that you, I won't bore you guys unless you really want to know, but United States, this is where these biggest demographic trends are happening. Okay. And then what you're going to see is you're also seeing uh, at the same time, you're seeing inflation. So the people that are believing in crypto and gold and believing that there's too much money printing going on. Okay. Those people are arguing that there's inflation going on. It's causing prices to rise. And the other side of it, the people that aren't believing that don't believe that there's, you know, runaway inflation leading to hyperinflation. Those people are blaming the rising costs on demographics. But the bottom line result is, is prices are going to continue to rise. So is there, what, why would there not be, there's a better way, Rick, to approach this question. Why would there not be a bust? Okay. Why would there not be? Uh, the demand stays strong and, and houses and interest rates stay affordable. Okay, so if, if interest rates do rise, there will be a slowing of the market for sure. But yeah. if it, it will there will there be uh, that won't change demographics. I mean, when Julie and I bought our first right. house, interest rates were seven percent. I bet you when you bought your first house, interest rates were at least five percent. You didn't care. Oh yeah. oh yeah. Right. See what I'm saying? I mean, Juan's only known interest rates that are less than two percent. <laughs> I'm sure. And, and, and anything starts approaching five, and I'm like, oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, but dude, listen, it doesn't matter. People will still buy and sell real estate because people buy and people have been buying and selling real estate during this post-crash uh, boom market for the right reasons. Buying and selling because they have bigger houses, need smaller houses, and whoever died on the other end of the country, so we have to sell that house. Houses in probate you know, uh, people moving up to ego houses and shit like that. So the market is healthy right now. There's not a lot of speculation. When was the last time you guys ran to someone and said, I'm going to buy, you know, 10 houses, you know what I'm saying? Because I think they're all like buying Willy Wonka golden tickets. That's that. That's not in this market. And furthermore, mm -hmm. the amount of equity that people have in their houses, did you guys know there's a record amount of equity that Americans have in their homes right now? Did you know that? Really? Yeah. It's like over a trillion dollars. And there's also over a trillion dollars of personal savings too. But here's the real reason why it won't crash is because that everyone will like if we had somebody who was a big, you know, crash zealot, here's what they'd say. All the forbearance is coming to an end. Then I'd mm -hmm. ask them because I've had this conversation. Right. Well, tell me about that. How many are coming to an end? How many of those people are going into default? How many of them are, are you know, reconstituting their mortgages? I'll give you the numbers. Virtually all of them are, are getting their payments back in line again after they're off, off uh, forbearance. OK, so there is no big surge. The total number of projected uh, defaults that's going to happen over the next 24 months, including. So there's 250,000 are in default now that were in default prior to COVID, most of them. And you're they're only expecting roughly another 400,000. And these are statistics coming from different you know, sources. But that's it. 600,000. Big deal. The mm -hmm. next two years. So you're talking about right. you know, maybe 300,000 a year over the next two years. Who cares? Right. So there is no there is no crash. And Rick, I'll even go as far as to challenge you on your thinking with regards to a bubble. So what's not a bubble? You couldn't you couldn't I argue that every single aspect of every single thing that you invest in is a bubble? Oh, I don't believe there's a bubble whatsoever. Everybody buying yeah. right now are end users, right? The the lending regulations are so strict right now. Um, you know, there's a lot of differences in now in 2003 and four. No, that's no, I definitely. All I would think was would be is that there could be a, a slight decrease in activity, which would be a great thing, right? Which would be a great thing for real estate agents, right? It would create the situation where we aren't competing against 15 buyers every listing. We may have a few more listings to choose from. That would be a great thing. Okay? Some agents are saying, 
what if I get in right now and the market crashes? <laughs> I'm like, that would be a good thing. You know, if inventory comes up and demand comes down a little, even if prices kind of correct a little bit, that would be an amazing thing for real estate agents. So no, I don't, I don't see a bubble whatsoever. The greatest fortunes are made during the greatest times of change. And we're in the, we're in, one, we're in the midst of that now. Here's another thing that's fascinating to think about. COVID has brought forth changes that would have taken 10 years for people to experience to mm -hmm. like freaking 18 months. Mm -hmm. I mean, you guys know about Starlink, for example. You know, Starlink? We, okay, so Julie and I have been talking about on Sunday, we do our Nerd Out podcast. Basically, it's not real estate coaching radio. It's wherever the hell we want to talk about. Uh -huh. And so we pay attention to his big trends. You know, sometimes we talk about aliens. You know, I mean, you know, I basically I bring to the podcast shit that's trying to shock my wife. Like a few weeks like, ago. Like Area 51 stuff. Totally. Some, I like, the, dude, there's, you got to restart. It's, we talk about stupid stuff on Sunday just for fun. I'll tell you one of the things I brought up to the podcast. So Julie's very, you know, very prim and proper, very buttoned up. So I had an article that I found on Bloomberg that the sex doll industry had blown up, like was one of the best investments <laughs> because of COVID. And so I read this story during our Sunday podcast and she didn't even blank. Yes, so what? Of course, that makes sense. Anyway, that's Sunday. What were you just talking about? <laughs> <laughs> The market crashing. Well, Aliens think, buying real estate. I think that's where but, we left off. Well, I mean, oh, I remember Starlink. So Starlink is one of the yeah. things that Julie and I've been paying attention to. Elon Musk invest, invested in this company called Starlink. And Starlink essentially is putting satellites all over planet Earth. Like imagine a web of satellites. And these satellites are going to provide high-speed internet connectivity for the places in the, on planet Earth that have never had high-speed internet connectivity. Mm. And it's going to be basically really, really cheap. That means that the places that have typically not, people haven't been able to live there because of lack of, you know, connection, connective, they couldn't move from the big cities to those more rural areas. They're now moving there. And so you're seeing these secondary markets that have, or these you know, cursory, rate. So there's A, B, and C markets, right? An A market would be LA, a B market would be Riverside County, a C market would be like Joshua Tree, right? No one's gonna live up in Joshua Tree, but now people are moving. There's a housing boom in Joshua Tree. Because people are able to get internet connection, they don't. Have, they can. The COVID has made it so it's okay for people to work online. I mean, this little situation is now normal, which is amazing. I love it personally. You know, you get a little bit burned out on Zoom after a while, but it's still pretty amazing. So the nature of people, the expectation of how people are going to live, has completely changed. People are not going to be ham hocked to the beliefs that they had prior to COVID. How many people, the second they had the opportunity, moved the hell out of the big cities, moved? Isn't that amazing? Absolutely. Yeah, Did absolutely. That, I didn't surprise me at all, honestly, because Julie and I've never wanted to be city, you know, city people. But the number of people mm -hmm. that moved out of New York, moved out of the towers in Miami, moved out of these centralized areas. Look at Atlanta. There's people that are moving up to the, the Appalachian area, you know, in North mm -hmm. Carolina, all mm -hmm. that. How Julie and I have a little cabin up in Murphy, North Carolina. You know, it's 2,500 square feet. This little, you know, it's in the hills, basically, in the mountains. Those prices in that market, that's always, that was never a hot market. Because it's two hours from anywhere. Those prices are like doubling. Why? Because people are moving out of the big cities because they can hook up a satellite and they're good to go and they want to work where they, they want to live where they, that's the lifestyle people are going to want. You can't put that genie back in the bottle. Same goes with homeschooling. Same goes with all these types of things. Um, so, I mean, so, they're, so they're putting a, like a satellite, like a direct TV satellite on their house? For it's the small, internet? dude. It's a small satellite. Yeah. Just go to Starlink and research it. It's incredible. But so, so all these trends, which would have happened over a decade or more, were condensed because of COVID. Okay, here's mm -hmm. one that we'll all appreciate. EXP. Yeah, yeah. Holy tamale. Yeah, no, it definitely showed people that they didn't need an office. Right. Right. But you know what I think is even more interesting? is the fact that I believe there's even a larger group of agents who kind of stayed put where they were and to try to see how this whole thing is going to play out. I see, I think we're going to see an even larger surge as the, as the, as things start opening up more and more and more. Um, I think there's an even larger, a larger, much larger surge um, on the way. If you ask me. I'll tell you where it's going to come from, too, in my humble opinion. The small and medium-sized independent brokerages, which still make up more than 50% of all the brokerages in the United States, they're mom and pops, you know? Yeah. And, and those yeah. are the ones that are going to be coming next to EXP because the, the cost structure, especially on the buyer agent side, just, to, just for the sake of your listeners, guys, or viewers, or whatever, you know, the pendulum, basically, that's what we're dealing with. So over here during the housing crash here, during the housing crash, you, there were builders giving away houses. Buy a, in Victorville, Julie and I drove past a sign that said, buy a house, get one for free. Not making that up. 
Okay, this was the extreme buyer's market. Now it's gone to the extreme seller's market where basically they're gonna, there's gonna be essentially in some markets, you're gonna have to, as a buyer's agent, get your buyer to pay your commission, right? So you're, mm. these inspect, now to Ricky's point, as the market starts to correct, interest rates rise. I mean, not correct, but as the market starts to adjust, then it's gonna slowly go down here. And then when it reaches this equilibrium, that's where people are gonna have, a, you know, but this is going to take three to five years at least. Yeah. And I'll, and I'll tell you why. To the interest rate thing you guys are saying, the Fed's already said they're going to keep rates low for at least three to five years. Right. And look at all the money they're pumping in the economy. Where's that money going? Where's the yep. money going? Yep. Housing, mm -hmm. assets. Yeah. Rick, what are you into? I mean, what like if you're if you have a Saturday, you have, you're I'm guessing a boating guy. I kite surf. Do you really? Yep. Do you know where we live is one of the number one places in like- No, I looked it up. I looked it up. Me and Juan actually talked to a lawyer down there to uh, to see what it would look like if we tried to do what you're doing down there. And we actually looked at that and I, I pulled it up. I pulled up all the kite surfers. I'm going to come down there, um, not to move down there anytime soon, but I'm going to come down there and kite surf very soon. Um, I'll talk I'm, about I'll talk about Puerto Rico if you guys want to. Where, where I, are you exactly? What town? Dorado. Dorado. Okay. Is yeah. there is there kite surfing there? Big time, the, the, the okay. beach here in Dorado. But there's um, Dorado and then there's another one, um, trying to remember, R Rincon. Rincon is the big surfer's beach. R Dorado is the big, so you know, to kite, well, you guys know, you have to, the, the wind has to blow a certain way, you know, yeah. it has to basically be parallel to shore. Otherwise you get blown out in the ocean, you get blown into the beach. Right. Right, so uh, that's, I mean, that's, this is one of the, matter of fact, get this dude, a, a friend of ours just had the world record. Uh, it, it was over 40 feet, Ricky, in the air with this kite surfing. Nice, nice. Yeah, yeah no, I, I to, see it here. I see it here. This is prime. This is on the prime time side of the island. Yeah, it is for kite surfing. Well, it's a prime. It's also the incredible place to live too. Oh yeah, oh yeah. We checked it out. We looked at it. We thought about it. The only thing about us is I didn't want to feel like I was on house arrest. Like I had to go there for six months. You come to Dorado, you won't want to leave. <laughs> I, Ricky, just I, I'm I'm a poor kid from Columbus, Ohio. I used to clean cars for a living, right? Yeah. I I, I grew up, and my bedroom was probably about. I mean, it was like smaller than a prison cell. I mean, I, you know, there were poor me shit. I could go on forever. But here's the thing: we live at the Ritz Carlton now in Puerto Rico, in Dorado, and mm -hmm. we're surrounded with people that are far wealthier than we are. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. um, you know. It, and so the point being is when you're one of the best ways you can elevate your life is be around other people that are not just one leg above you going mm -hmm. back to really, you know, a coach, you want to be around somebody and other, you want to have friends that are like, dude, I met a guy, his name's also Ricky. How hilarious is that? He just moved here from Florida. He's the, he's the Florida's largest. He calls himself a roofing contractor, but he really isn't. He makes probably low nine figures per year. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Um, he's, you know, he was telling me about and texting me pictures of these, he's buying a Koenigsegg for $1.8 million. I don't know if you know what that is. So, and this guy is uh, 36. And so, you know, I, those people, and we are, and, but you meet, there's another guy that Julie and I know that owns a hedge fund. There's like rumors there's within this little 1300 acre place we live, there's supposedly seven billionaires. There, wow. it, it, it's incredible. And, 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 and here's a bit. They, they, they reside there full time. That, that That's their primary residence. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but you don't you don't you want to reside here full time when you live here. Mm -hmm. You want mm -hmm. to because mm -hmm. it's it's like have you guys ever read the book Atlas Shrugged? What no. is it? Atlas Shrugged. You guys should both write that no. down. Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. Atlas Shrugged. You got to get that book. Now I'm going to promise you it's massive, so you might just want to get one of those summary books of it. Mm. Seriously, just get the summary one because the book's yeah. massive. And the movie's not good, so just get the summary version of it. But the gist of it is, well, I will, again, I don't want to go off on a flight of fancy. But if you guys want to have, answer, have me answer questions about Puerto Rico, I will. But the number one reason we moved here, Ricky, wasn't for the financial things. It was a close number two. The number one was is because Julie had developed really, really bad asthma, which she'd never had before when we lived in Texas. And her doctor said she's got to move from Texas. They, she was on three different inhalers. And she only had 50% lung capacity. That's like COVID type lung capacity. So the doctor said, you guys have to move from here. And then she said, these are the list of places you can possibly live. We didn't want to live in Hawaii. We did visit it. Um, we lived in Southern California part-time. We didn't want to ever go back there. 
Um, and then it was Puerto Rico. And there's no other places that have this. So she's not allergic to the, the stuff that's out there. And she's not on anything now. No, no drugs whatsoever. That was the number one reason. That's, um, that's amazing. Was the, the business opportunities here are extraordinary. Because mm -hmm. look, Puerto Rico is in a depression. And the, the, all, there's not even been that many people that have done acts that have moved down here. And if you read the actual reports of how much money that's being pumped into the Puerto Rican economy, it's extraordinary. So many people getting jobs and, you know, it's, it's an amazing place. You feel like a bit of a, um, a pioneer, but you can feel that um, this place, the people are like Texans in their character. Um, and it's mm -hmm. very incredibly entrepreneurial and not like, like when I was young, when I was a kid and, you know, I had these mooring lines and beliefs about rich people. I, and came, as I got older, I realized they were wrong. Here, you've never met more generous, more wonderful people. I, mm -hmm. I have not met a single person that I didn't want to hang out with. Not one. You know, or do, it's or do you uh, do you uh, do you see Jay? Yeah, I saw him yesterday did, when we were driving around our golf carts. Is he in uh, is he in the same yeah. vicinity? Cool. Yeah, he's about cool. probably 15 minutes away by golf cart. And Mike Reese is too. Nice. And all the other all the other uh, EXP people live down in a place called Palmas, which is about an hour away. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a lot no. cheaper in Palmas. Like oh, Palmas. What's, can, what's what's your day to day like, Tim? Like, is it you wake up and just have a walk on the beach, or yeah, like a much. vacation all the time? Uh, I mean, you know, you got to work, but I mean, what you just said. We get up in the morning, and you know, we have a daughter, so we've been homeschooling her. But we'll go on a walk. You know, all three of us with our French bulldog. We'll, do, you know, Julie was on the. It's a our the beach is probably five minutes away. And we just walk, we go out our front door and return to the right. And then we just walk straight down. But I'll tell you a funny story. So Julie's walking on the beach herself with our French bulldog. And there's some guy comes up and starts petting the French bulldog. It was Ricky Martin. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you another one. So she, she seriously, so she, right? And she didn't even know it was Ricky Martin. She goes, he looks familiar. And then she Googled him and she realized who it was. <laughs> Right. So she's walking into the, there's a cafe near her and, and on the property and she walks in and she walks past this and she says, Hola, you know, we speak a little bit of Spanish. She speaks Spanish pretty fluently. And uh, she walks past Sean Penn <laughs> and they, they have this little exchange. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, Jay and I were rolling around in a golf cart and um, we, we are going one way and this big mob of people were going the other way. And Jay goes, that's, um, I'm trying to remember his name. He's a really famous comedian, um, Dave Chappelle. Mm -hmm. So Dave Chappelle and, these, and this big mob of people are going the opposite direction. Jay said, Tim, that's Dave Chappelle. And I go, no way. I think he's great. <laughs> and so we spin around. And so the road goes like this and it goes up a hill. And then Dave and I, or, or Jay and I spin around. We start going up the hill. And as soon as we turn this bend, Dave's assistant and Dave are, are parked there. So this hill, Dave, and he's riding a bike and it's only a single gear. So he has to stop basically. And he's balancing, rebalancing on the bike. So Jay and I pull around the corner, assistant, very nice kid, J, uh, Dave. And I, and I said, Dave, you have a choice. You either take a picture with us or we're going to run over you. And so he looks, <laughs> he looks over his shoulder and he goes, run over me. I'm on vacation. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Yeah, Bruce Willis was just here. Um, you know, we there, this is a this is a place that is extraordinary. We've never, I mean, celebrities aside, this is amazing. How old's your daughter? The, the, so, uh, yeah. It, how, you're, you're, what, what, well, how, how I just want to know real quickly, like, because uh, you know my daughter's 16 months old. What is it oh, like? Congratulations. For, thank you. What What is it like for for kids there? Incredible. There's mm. look. Write this down. Look up the Tassis School. T uh, T A S I S Google it. The school is exceptional. It's a, it's basically a, it's a, a European style college prep school. I'm telling you exceptional. And then Tim, you, it, the Ritz Carlton, that's a condo residence or is it no, like a hotel not, slash not, resort? They're, condos, they're homes. It's uh, the Ritz Carlton. Mm -hmm. Basically this is a Ritz Carlton preserved property. I believe in the world, there's only uh, four of them, maybe not even four, maybe only three. So in essence, this is a, it, the center of it is a six star resort. You know, it's a Ritz Carlton. They're not even, there's not even really, you, you're picturing a big building with hotel rooms. It's nothing like that. These are individual villas that are on the beach, basically. That's what the Ritz Carlton is. And it's got this incredible spa and this whole thing. And so surrounding on, in, within the same property, there's neighborhoods, there's little, there's communities, some of which got started in the nineties, others, which are brand new. I mean, the average sale price here is, I don't, I mean, I'm not even really sure now, maybe 3 million. Their, their properties, there was a property that sold maybe a month ago for 50 million. There was one that sold like a week or two weeks before that for 30 million. This is a, you know, a weird place. Yeah. 
So we don't have much time left. I want to get into one more question. I want to get your take real quickly. Um, just for everybody that, you know, there's this whole group of agents. I don't know what the percentage is. It's just kind of scared about this whole Zillow showing time or something's going to replace agents or agents are going to be obsolete in 20 years kind of thing. You know, you're a sharp guy. I, I don't want to let everybody hear your take on this. Whether agents will be obsolete. Yeah. Yeah. Like, okay. like people are saying, you know, our agents are going to be obsolete, you know, why should I get into real estate? You know, they're not even going to, that, that, that job isn't even going to exist in a decade. Well, it also that they've been saying that Brad Inman specifically has been saying that since the nineties and Brad's a friend. And I love him. He's one, he's a true icon of real estate, but he's been saying that since the nineties, it's called disintermediation. It's to me to remove the middleman. And mm -hmm. the problem with that is that the human brain always wants to have somebody of authority helping him with a stressful situation. And that'll mm -hmm. always be true. And it's always been true. And you have, look, I don't even think, honestly, if it's a commoditized product, a condo, that's all the same. I can see that there's a low skilled salesperson that might be a part of those transactions that maybe is an hourly type, but anything that's more real estate's all different. People's personalities are all different. Most people will avoid anything that has to do selling a house, buying a house are the two of the most uh, having a baby. Like you just said, there's some of the most stressful things you can experience in your life. People will always want a trusted advisor. Mm -hmm. um, and as mm -hmm. far as Zillow goes, people that do business with Zillow are essentially nailing, the, uh, putting the nails in their own coffin. It doesn't mm -hmm. even make sense. I, 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 not once have we told agents to buy buyer leads and certainly not from Zillow. And of course, they're going to be your competitor. So here's the real bugaboo with Zillow. And this is the reason, one of the many reasons we love EXP, Ricky, is if you, like people are saying, well, Zillow's I buyer flipping houses. Okay. What are they doing with all those seller leads that they're getting? where they aren't buying the houses. Well, they're referring them to agents for now. And then what's going to happen is they're going to keep those themselves. So if the house I buyer widget is, it's the greatest listing lead generator ever. Mm. Agreed? Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, other than picking up the phone, it is. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. You know, so that's what they're going to do. And people, don't, they're not putting two and two together. Mm. So you're the greatest. So the question is, is, you know, if it's five years from now, it's going to be EXP. I think it's going to be Zillow. Zillow is not going anywhere. And then there's probably going to be, there's going to be maybe a consortium of other brands, but every, all the brokerages are going to have to emulate EXP. You mm -hmm. know, KW is supposedly gearing up to uh, go uh, public. All these different, you know, things are going to be happening in reaction to essentially what Zillow and EXP are doing. And look what the Compass IPO was. The Compass IPO was yeah. very encouraging because that show, tells you that major investors are still willing, to, or that are very much interested in investing and uh, real estate companies, the the day of the you know the real estate uh, opportunity for investors, anyway, is, is still seen ahead of us. That's the theory, anyway. Yeah. But there's no chance that real estate practitioners will ever go away. Yeah. Ones that don't know so how either. to list properties and generate their own leads, ones that are beholden to buying their business, they're going to go away for sure. Yeah. Well said, man. Well said. This has been an incredible conversation, man. We need to bring you back on the show. Whatever. It's all good. Yeah, you need to come back, man. You're so much calmer now, Ricky. That's, I love it. I like this Ricky. He's like chill. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> man, the back then, back in the day, I was trying to make a million dollars. Okay. So. And you did it. Yeah. Yeah. Finally. Yeah. You know what I learned? You know what I learned through, through our sessions was that I was doing everything I was supposed to be doing. I was looking for the special magic key that I was missing. And what I realized through it was that I was already doing everything I needed to do. And my only problem was patience. That That's was the right. only problem was patience. Yep. So. It's, it, Rick, it all comes down to doing what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it at the highest level. And everything in life takes, I mean, is this your first kid? Yeah. You're 40. Okay. Yeah. So you, you know, basically everything in life is gonna, that's worth having is going to take like five times. Carlos, this is good advice for you, son. <laughs> listen, listen to the old farts here. But everything in life, everything in life worth having is going to take like five times, if not longer, 10 times longer. And here, Rick, do you know when most people earn their peak incomes? When do, when do demographically, you right? If you look at income, charts, I think, I think it's like in the early sixties, huh? Well, it's a little bit younger than that. It's like late forties, mid fifties, early sixties. Oh, so there's yeah, a, a lot younger. You're, you're not even there yet, but you, right. you will, you'll, you know, you, your peak earning because the moves you're making right now, especially with the XP, yours will, you know, happen about now and will never dissipate. You should, if you make the right moves, you should continue to ascend. Mm -hmm. Your your challenge, and frankly, everyone's challenge that's involved with the XP, who understand the opportunity and the blessing that Glenn created with Revenue Share, is to really make the most of that opportunity and create generational wealth opposed to just, you know, spending on boats and 
You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's the, that's the thing. You got to be thinking long term. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No, absolutely, man. No, I appreciate everything you do and we appreciate you and, um, you know, everything that you've done for the industry and, um, you know, want to see you keep shining. Yeah, we will. We're not going anywhere. We love it too much. So by the way, real estate coaching radio, I'm going to give myself a plug. Yeah, no, please do. How how can people reach out to you? Rude bastards. I can't believe that. (laughs) So real, real estate coaching radio, uh, just listen to our podcast. You know, it's the number one listened to daily podcast for real estate agents in at least the United States. Right. You know, we have on a slow day, 35,000 downloads on a really normal day. It's 50 to 60,000 downloads. Nice. Just like with you, Ricky, the market has spoken, right? Nice. That is right. nice. That's beautiful. And how long have you guys been doing that podcast? 2014. We've got 2014. In the bag. Yeah. Great. Great. Cool, man. Well, like I said, we appreciate you and uh, we'll bring you back on the show soon. Uh,